de Andrea Vicente eh, Osvaldo Vicente Sartone. Antonio, ¿sí? Antonio, no, es que Antonio es mi apellido, claro. Antonio es mi apellido, segundo apellido. Ah, sí. I will talk very briefly. I will try to, sometimes it's difficult after the meal um, to try to, <laughs> to give up. The central objective that I have here is to try to give the idea of systems of knowledge, of course, as a possible topic. And the second one is the research that we have been working in the National Academic Institute and the that belongs to the The title is a little long. I would like to let you focus with your attention essentially on the most that I would like to do. Persistence biology, of course, I will talk about this. The human metabolism that currently, uh, in some years ago, there has been reported a great effort in terms of the reconstruction of the metabolism of human cells. And that constitutes an uh, interesting platform in order to prove hypotheses and to try to generate systemic analysis in terms of uh, human diseases. The second one, the, the third word, the keyword that I consider very important is precision medicine. Is um, uh, cutting edge is a, a, a line of research that currently in medical science is trying to evolve. Many institutes in systems biology has been trying to apply this new type of medicine that essentially consists in to apply a medicine in a personalized uh, fashion, combining, of course, high throughput technology, computational modeling, and of course, biological knowledge. And the, third, and the last word that I would like to focus is in cancer. Most of the results that I will present here is about the metabolism properties in cancer. Cancer has been a great and a very complex diseases. Currently, uh, I remember some, some professor that uh, was given a lecture in UCSD, and the audience that we were in that moment said, uh, 
most of you will have cancer during uh, the rest uh, uh, the rest of your life there is a high probability that the person suffer of this type of diseases so how systems biology can contribute to this uh, analysis is one of the central uh, objectives that I have here. Systems biology, only briefly, is uh, essentially is difficult to define it. However, there are some uh, pro properties, general, um, let's say, it, uh, properties, hallmarks, that you can define the area uh, of the study. The objective, from my point of view, is to try to elucidate the genotype and the phenotype relation. It's a central question in biology uh, for living organism. Essentially, how two biological properties emerge, starting from the interaction of the elements. It's like a puzzle. We have many small pieces of information that can be genes, proteins, metabolites, reactions, etc. And with all these puzzles, or with all these uh, elements, we try to construct a big puzzle and try to understand what is occurring in living systems. There are some properties, there are some uh, keywords that uh, we can characterize in systems biology. One of them is that we will use network. It means all the biological information that we have available for one specific organism, let's say E. coli of human, of human organism or one bacteria, is possible to identify to represent this knowledge in terms of a network. There are many kinds of networks, transcriptional regulatory networks, like we see in the morning, metabolic networks, protein-protein interaction networks, and so on. All this information is coming from biological knowledge. This is a very important thing. And um, this supply with a mathematical scheme to try to explore the landscape and eventually to make a quantitative model of one system. And the second property is we will use computational modeling in order to make a prediction and a qualitative analysis of these metabolic capacities. This is extremely important. Once we have this mathematical representation of this network, we can predict, we can make predictions, we can make a hypothesis about which one are the principles that sustain, that relates the relationship between genotype and the phenotype. Once we have uh, this modeling, we have constructed some hypotheses. The last step, which is extremely important, is go back to the lab and try to move experimental design and prove if the model has or no reason. One of the important, powerful um, race in, in systems biology is hydropook technology. Currently, we have uh, been able, there is a big uh, number of data in the web, such that we have information about the genomic uh, data about a great number of organisms, maybe 100,000, maybe. What is a specific information and available information in order to supply it and to analyze the phenotype behavior for this specific organism. In addition, we have another technology, like Proteome, the capacity to monitor the proteins in terms of qualitative sense of thousands of proteins in one tissue, for instance. We have the technology of metabolome, the metabolic concentration for most of the, of, of the components inside the cell, and so on. There are a variety of uh, omics data that eventually every one of these omics data constitute different levels of biological information. The genome, the transcriptome, how the genes turn on, turn down, the proteome, how these proteins interact between them, the metabolome, which represent the metabolic reactions, and eventually, as uh, we said in the morning, the phenotype behavior. There is a great level of description to go from this, from the genome information, going through this different layers of uh, biological uh, knowledge forward to understand uh, the phenotype behavior. Which one is the, the goal? To understand and to make a coherent interpretation. This is not an easy task. It's one of the, the central objectives in systems biology. Of course, we have now the dogma central of biology. We have knowledge that now many of these layers of information can regulate another layers uh, of biological, uh, maybe in the top or in the, bat, in the bottom, I'm sorry. So this uh, relationship is extremely complex, and in order to understand this, we require of computational modeling. There are some paradigms in systems biology. I will present one of them that essentially is the bottom-up scheme, essentially consists 
Once we, you have selected one organism to study, let's say one bacteria, E. coli, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, for, for instance, we uh, use all metabolome data, uh, omics data, like genome, transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, fluxome, and so on, in order to make a metabolic reconstruction of this specific organism. Once we have this metabolic reconstruction, we represent in a mathematical sense, using differential equations, for instance, matrices, in order to make questions to this, to this organism. You can analyze, once you have the mathematical representation, you can explore the topology structure of the network. It means the architecture of this network. Uh, you can explore the dynamical behavior, how the noise can be reduced or increased for the organism, and so on. After you have uh, this hypothesis, you can make the analysis for this organism, you can explore and you can construct certain hypotheses. These hypotheses are very useful in order to go to the lab and prove if it makes sense or not. This is one example, only to clarify the things that I am, I am talking about. This paradigm represents the, the gly glycolysis, for instance. Here is the pathway. Every one of these dots represents the metabolites. For every one of these um, metabolic reactions, we construct a database that contains the metabolic reactions, which one are the enzymes that codify for these reactions, which one is the mRNAs that codify for these proteins, and which are the genes that represent these mRNAs. So we have a different uh, database for one organism that contains information about the genome information, the mRNAs, the proteins, eventually the, the enzymes that will contribute to, uh, proper, to suggest the gas free energy for one specific reaction and eventually the metabolic reaction. If you do this exercise for all the genome, the human genome for instance, or the, the genome for rhizobium metli, which is the bacteria that fix nitrogen uh, fixation, it's possible to make a reconstruction of a set of reactions that represent certain transformation from metabolites and at the same time gives the property to analyze the metabolic capacity of this organism. This S that you observe here is called the stoichiometric matrix. It is the mathematical way to represent every one of these reactions, metabolic reactions that are occurring in the specific organism in such a way that this uh, transformation is, uh, contains genome information. It means it's specified in terms of the genome that we are interested in. There are some organisms that are able to, to go in on certain metabolic reactions that other organism does not have the, does cap, that capacity. All this information is contained here. This is the thermodynamic properties which represent the flux of the metabolic reaction for every one of the, of the, of the transformation that I am included. And this X is a vector that contains the information of the concentration of all the metabolites. This is a very simple, it's a, it's a cartoon of what is occurring in reality. However, it's a very good cartoon, it's a very good model in order to explore and to construct hypotheses. We can, one way to relate the topology properties, the genome information specific for one organism, the thermodynamic properties of these metabolic reactions, and the concentrations for this, for this uh, reconstru specific reconstruction. Let's say, for instance, you have the concentration of ATP, glucose, lactate, and so on. Currently, uh, we have uh, biological information using bioinformatics. We have the ability, in addition, to identify that some of the reactions can be uh, going on in certain compartments in the cell. Some of the reactions can be going on in the cytoplasm, for instance, and some other in other organelles. In addition, uh, it's possible to include here in these simple equations the external conditions, which specify the experimental conditions that you are going on in your lab. For instance, the hypoxia condition, that it means the concentration of oxygen are extremely low, or you are using glucose like a carbon source, or can be another one. And all this information can be included here. Okay. For the case of cancer, which is one of the objectives of this talk. The metabolism now has been uh, increased the interest in this area because um, in 1920, Otto Warburg suggests that when you analyze the metabolism of one normal cells and you compare 
the metabolism for a cancer cell, it's possible to observe certain alterations, metabolic alteration. The most classical is the cold warbuck effect that consists and suggests that the cancer cells consume glucose and produce lactate, even in the presence of oxygen. This is extremely important. The question is why? If you, if the cancer cell you are observing that is proliferated in a high rates, how is possible why the cell, why the cancer cell use a, apparently a less efficient mechanism to produce ATP? Eventually, the, produce, uh, the glycolysis produce two ATP per molecule of glucose, and why not use another type of more efficient weight? This is the Warburg effect and currently has practical implication in the PET, for instance, in positron emission tomography, where when, this, when the, 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 the people mark label the glucose, it's possible in vivo to observe which one are the, the cells, the cancer cells, and how the glucose is consumed in a high rate. So the metabolism now is considered like one hallmark of cancer, independent of what type of cancer you are talking about, always there will be certain metabolic transformation required to produce the metabolites to supply the biomass production in, an, in a proliferative way, accelerate proliferative, proliferative way. Let me talk and let me present which one is the basic of our team. This is the idea. Initially, we have a metabolic network. You can imagine the, the, net, the, the, the pathway, for instance, or the uh, one, uh, the, one transportation mechanism in a city. And essentially, when you go, when you introduce one molecule like glucose, eventually this is distributed. In cancer, the thing and the more intuitive way to suggest or to, to model in cancer is to assume that this glucose or another carbon source are distributed in, in some, such a way that the metabolites that are produced are those required for biomass production, but not in a, in a, in a normal way instead in a maximal production of biomass. This problem is equivalent to this one, where I am in one point of the city, and I would like to go to another point, like the Socalo, and I would like to find which one is the most optimal way to go in from one point in the city to another one. It's exactly the same problem here. If I have some metabolites that comes from the environmental conditions, how this metabolism should be distributed in order to ensure a maximal production of biomass. So in the lab, we have, following this simple idea, we have some projects that I will present very briefly here that, that um, in, in a sense, include uh, these three lines, three points of uh, objectives. The level of development of methods and software, of course, this is not a simple question to try to sure to identify how the, the pathways are activated or distributed, especially given when you introduce or consider a metabolic reconstruction for human of around 7,000 metabolic reactions. So it's a big problem. So it's needed to develop software in order to analyze, analyze this, this objective. In the lab, we have uh, essentially the objective to analyze the metabolic activity in cancer. However, currently there is evidence that this metabolism is not as simple. There is a variety of heterogeneity in such a way, as I will present in the last part of my talk, in such a way that some of the parts, even in, inside a tumor, some of the cells has some metabolic profiles and others has ones complete, completely different from the first one. So we have some components, and there are another uh, projects that we are uh, considering, all around in cancer. The strategy of, uh, of our group essentially is divided in three regions. Of course, always, when you try to model in, we have a variety of knowledge that we don't know. For instance, the gifts free energy, the kinetic parameters in order to model it in a differential equation uh, way, um, the concentration even of the metabolites, which uh, some of them should be able to introduce stochastic noise in some of the metabolic reactions. So we have a lot of, of knowledge. No? So um, the strategy in order to analyze the cancer, which is a big problem, is that we have divided in three steps. The first one is to analyze cell lines, cancer cell lines, which are um, cell lines that uh, are controlled in a lab. It's a more uh, easy, let's say, way to analyze the 
um, capacitives of our model. We have models in uh, two-dimensional and in three-dimensional, considering that when you in increase the volume, it means you simulate a cancer in 3D, always there are some effects in the metabolism that can introduce heterogeneity. The second step, the first one is to work with cell lines. It's a more controlled system. The second one is to try to move toward living systems. So we have some projects in terms of hepatocarcinoma in tissues, in rats, which is a system more complex. And eventually, our last objective is to try to move to apply all this methodology that I will present for personalized medicine. It means if you have one patient, how systems biology should be able to suggest the most strategy, the most optimal strategy in terms of treatments, for instance. So, summarizing, the things that we do is one of the paradigms in, in systems biology is once we have the genome of one specific organism, we identify the components, it means these pieces, este, these pieces of the puzzle, let's say, that can be proteins, genes, metabolites, etc., and we make a reconstruction of the metabolism, of the feasible capacities of this organism has um, in reality. Once we have the network, we represent in a mathematical sense, and then goes the model of the, of the system. No? What are we doing in terms of the metabolism? in cancer. This is one example I will present. This is one specific idea. Is, uh, we analyzed in this year these HeLa cancer cells. HeLa is the cell line most uh, well studied around the world. So we make this simple example, uh, an experiment. First of all, we make a curve of growth for the HeLa in such a way do, that we monitor according to the time before which one were the concentration of this HeLa cancer cell in a Petri dish. was a very simple model. And then we use this formalism in terms of differential equation and make a re metabolic reconstruction of central metabolism. It means it contains TC cycle, uh, uh, um, um, glycolysis, pentose phosphate, etc. This uh, metabolic reconstruction contained almost 100 metabolic reactions. In addition, we include the environmental condition. The low concentration was very slow. No? Glucose was the principal uh, carbon source. Glutamine is possible to import from the external condition, from the environmental to the internal of the cell. And we made the simulation now trying to reproduce these, uh, these results. We identify the parameters in order to calibrate our model in such a way that we obtain an agreement, a qualitative agreement between the things that we measure in experimental sense and the things that we uh, reproduce in a silico way, let's say. Once we have that disagreement between computational modeling and, uh, and measurement, we make the following question. We would like to identify in the metabolism um, potential targets. It means potential metabolic reaction in all these network in such a way that if you reduce the metabolic flux, the rate of uh, growth will decrease. The rate of proliferation will decrease. This is important because it's uh, one way, let's say, to suggest uh, one qualitative way to explore and to design to suggest new uh, therapeutic uh, uh, development. These are the results. With one simple model, we close. In a model sense, you, we can make uh, this uh, close of these fluxes very simple in such a way that we can make all the combinatory process to close every one of these six cycles of these components in all this network. We identify some components, some metabolic reaction that uh, when you reduce the flux, does not happen. The growth rate remains. However, there are another metabolic reaction that when you reduce the activity, the metabolic activity, the growth rate will decrease. These are uh, central components to suggest potential targets in terms to define uh, specific methods to reduce the proliferation. And this is one of the predictions. Lactate dehydrogenase, pyruvate, fumarate, succinate, and we have another one. For the case of this one set, this set that appears in, in red, you can review the details in the paper. Another people in another labs has been working and using these, uh, these targets, these metabolic reactions, as potential mechanism to reduce the, the growth rate. In, it means 
that was in agreement with this simple model. We have another predictions that we should prove in an experimental sense to evaluate the capacities of the model. This is an important point. Until now, we have worked with uh, playing with this metabolic central metabolism. However, it's possible to include another pathways where um, in cancer has uh, very few knowledge. For instance, fatty acids, which one is the plate? If I increase the network and I include, include another metabolic reconstruction for fatty acids, for instance, or purines or pyrimidines, what will be the effect of some of these metabolic uh, pathways in terms of the growth or rate for the systems? we can explore in a quantitative way. After this type of models, there has been a variety of, of, uh, of new developments, let's say it, not, uh, not only including this simple description, not only uh, including the, meta the central metabolism, for instance. Currently, there has been, the, according to the time has been evolved, the people have been working now in a genome scale metabolic reconstruction, not only including 100 metabolic reactions, instead to try in, to increase the capacity of the network and explore the play that another pathway has in terms of cancer. There has been models um, where uh, now is, is possible to identify, to make a metabolic reconstructions uh, depending on tissue specificity. The cancer we know is not the same the cancer in the skin, like the, same, like the cancer of breast and so, so other type of cancer. Eventually, the metabolism is different. So it's needed to include the tissue specific in this reconstruction. And this is the last generation of this type of modeling. One thing that, um, that we have been working on very actively is with this type of high throughput technology. Of course, we are working with metabolism, and metabolome technology is extremely useful in order to figure out which one is the capacity of the fluxes you know, and identify and characterize them. So which one, if I have one metabolic reconstruction and I have metabolome data, how is possible to make biological interpretation from this data uh, in combination with another high throughput technology like RNA-seq? So in 2009, we published this paper that essentially consists to suggest a framework, a theoretical framework to analyze once we have uh, metabolic data and one metabolic reconstruction, it's possible to identify the kinetic parameters or let's say the metabolic phenotype capacities of this model, of this reconstruction, defined by the metabolome data. Once we have this metabolome data, we can define this set of cones that essentially represent the metabolic capacity of these micro, microorganisms, for instance, if it's E. coli or the other, and we can make, apply all the, the, the theory in the dynamical sense in order to explore how the dynamical behavior of this network can supply information about the way that the metabolites and the metabolic reaction in a network can behave. Okay, this idea goes to this uh, software that is a free software, it's, a, it's open source, it's called DICOM, that essentially has the, the following purpose. Once we have metabolome data for one control sample and one cancer, let's say uh, uh, cancer cell lines, for instance, we have the profiles, we have replicates for every one of the set. We designed one uh, computational method, mathematical method, in sense based on uh, algebra, lineal, lineal algebra, in order to define metabolic spaces. This blue cone represents the metabolic capacity for this control, and this red one represents the metabolic capacity for this anomalous disease, let's say. The interesting thing is that these cones are uh, sometimes it's possible to identify that they are overlapping representing and indicating that there are some metabolic reactions that are appearing in both of, these, of the conditions. The additional point is that some of the regions are specifically for every one of the physiological states. And these are important because that supply information with a specific metabolic reaction that should differentiate one state from the other one. This is, this is the idea, and with this idea we have been applied to a variety of, of components or problems well related with, um, with, uh, with cancer. One of them, of course, is in, cell, in cancer cell lines. The second one is to try to analyze this process. Epithelial mesenchymal transition is fundamental in, in, the, in, in cancer studies. Um, and the third one is 
this modeling now in higher systems, in more complex systems in rats. So I will present some, uh, some results. This uh, essentially we apply in this paper, we applied uh, metabolome technology in order to characterize the metabolic profile for HACAT and HILA. HILA is the cancer cell line, and HACAT is like the normal um, uh, cell lines, the control, let's say. For every one of these uh, states, we obtain almost um, 100 metabolic uh, metabolites uh, in concentrations. This is important. And with this, we apply our method. As I commend you, you have the metabolic for the sample control, you have the, the, the metabolome for the HILA cells. For every one of these, we apply the DICON procedure. It's possible to identify these cones, that is multi multidimensional properties, and eventually it's possible to identify the regions that are common between two states and the regions that are specific for every one of the physiological states. These regions that are specifically for the physiological states, again, supply with information about which one are the metabolic reactions that appear in one condition and does not appear in the second one. This is the metabolome profile. Eventually, these are the results that we obtained with um, capillarity electrophoresis uh, combined with mass spectrometry. And uh, with all this data, this is the final results. This is the network in red. You can identify it. this uh, arrow, red arrow, represent those reactions that are an up-regulation. It means has more activity in cancer and lower activity, of course, in the control. In the blue, this one, these blue components represent the opposite. It means in cancer, these metabolic reactions, the, 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 the metabolic flux is reduced in cancer. So we have uh, not all the reactions are marked in blue or in red in such a way that we can make hypotheses about which one is the, are the changes, the metabolic changes between one state and the other one. Okay, I will present very briefly one, uh, um, uh, one of the projects of, of the project that we have been working in this, um, with this formalism and the type of question that we are exploring. The first one is uh, these bottom-up schemes that is the name that we can identify in systems biology. Always there are bottom-up schemes or, or top-down schemes. Top-down scheme essentially is the high throughput technology when we apply uh, microarray data, RNA-6, or proteome or metabolome. Um, this uh, bottom-up essentially we has been applying this count. We have metabolome data for uh, a set of, uh, of cancer cell lines, lung cancer cell lines, after and before the transformation between epithelial uh, mesenchymal transformation. This is extremely important because these cells are capable to move now and make is the, one of the principal process in metastasis, which is extremely uh, important in the medical science. Combine, we can combine another technologies or another procedures like um, metabolic enrichment. One of the things that you can observe in the previous slides is that the metabolic reconstruction that we have essentially has been a central metabolism. However, we would like to explore another pathways. Using uh, microarray data or, um, or metabolome data, we can identify using enrichment analysis which one are the pathways that eventually can be differentiated between both conditions. This is a very classical uh, procedure in, in, in uh, bioinformatics. However, for us, it's an important way in order to identify which one are the pathways that you should, we should include in our reconstruction in order to increase the capacities. This is uh, the work that we have until now. Essentially, we have been working with these two uh, lung cancer cell lines. And as you can see, remember only, I remember that these arrows represent higher activity of metabolic, uh, metabolism after the, transi the transition. Um, and, and so, and the blue one is that is reduced reduce after the transition. Depending on the type of cancer cell lines, we can identify the behavior is completely different. Here, for instance, for this, for this one's cancer cell line, we can observe the TCA cycle seems to be reduced. It means the activity uh, decreases. Instead, uh, if we compare with this, this other one, cancer cell, li cell, cell line, we can observe, for instance, that the pentosphosphate pathway is increased. So this type of generation of hypotheses uh, contribute 
to understand and to make the science in experimental sense goes to the lab and try to make some maybe uh, techniques in order to decrease this uh, metabolic activity and observe if this uh, transition between the epithelial and mesenchymal transition will be reduced. This is another, another uh, component. If, for instance, the prediction that we can make, in particular this one, is the accumulation of humarit is associated with uh, epithelial and mesenchymal transition. It means when it happened the transition, this fumarit is, uh, is, is, is increasing. That's the point, and our model is in agreement with this type of, of, of conclusion. Of course, we should to evaluate most of the, of the results that we have. However, the central point in modeling is to suggest in an experimental sense what type of experimental experiment should be a focus in order to try to reduce the phenotype or control the phenotype. This is other of the, of the projects I will explain very briefly, question of time. Essentially, we are now moving to living system, which is more complex than playing with cancer cell lines. Now we have rats. Eventually, uh, we set a cohort of rats with uh, normal tissue, and this tissue that has uh, cancer uh, after 20 days when we apply a carcinogen element. It has been applied again, this uh, computational framework, and the results is the following. We can generate, as in previous one, we have been following the same notation. In red are the, the, the metabolic reactions that are increased the activity for cancer, uh, and blue is uh, the metabolic reaction that decreased the activity in the normal, normal cells. This supply with a, one way to analyze in a quantitative way, fashion, let's say, how the transformation from normal cells to cancer cells can be occurred. Of course, this is an average. When you take a biopsy, like was this the case, the biopsy is contained of uh, heterogeneity and extremely heterogeneity properties in terms of metabolism. So this is important to take into account. This is the average of the sample. This is another uh, of the results that we can obtain, for instance, in order to supply hypotheses like this enzyme that was interesting for us, like the presence of NADPH after the, 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 in the cancer. It means they play uh, an essential role in order to support the metabolic phenotype for cancer. And this one is another of the hypotheses that we have been uh, working on. Of course, we should prove we should go back, and this is uh, work that is going on. We should back to the lab and try to prove if the modeling makes sense about this one. Which one is the last objective in our team? Is to try to apply systems biology in, uh, in human, no? in precision medicine. How from one specific person, we have knowledge currently that even the cancer for one person is heterogeneous. And there is a variety of uh, heterogeneity by many reasons, by genetic reasons, by the environmental condition, etc. So this is one project that is going on in, um, in Inmegen and, and the uh, RAI. Essentially, we would like to identify, of course, persons, uh, the patients. Uh, we are interested in breast cancer. We would like to obtain health samples and cancer samples, biopsies, in this case. From these biopsies, we would like to identify the metabolome profile no? in order to observe which one are the metabolites that are common between these two conditions for the same patient, and which one are the metabolome that are different, different between them. And how, using our models, we can suggest the evaluation of a variety of, uh, of clinical uh, parameters that the medical has like the efficiency of the treatment, for instance, the evolution of the disease, the metabolic phenotype of, of different persons, of the same person, etc. This is a project that is going on. Another thing that we are doing, uh, working on in this uh, personalized medicine is this combination between um, um, generalized linear model in order to represent and to try to predict which one can be starting from the profiles the, uh, the, of, of the RNA, of the expression, gene expression profiles of one patient, how it's possible to identify and predict which one will be the growth rate. This uh, paper that was published uh, with Christian Diener, a postdoc in my lab, essentially make uh, these steps. First, we calibrate with NCI60, 
that is a database for 60 uh, cancer cell lines, that predict in a very weight, uh, uh, accurate way the growth rate of uh, these 60 cancer cell lines. We make a statistical uh, modeling in order to adjust the prediction between the model and the uh, experimental validation. And then we apply this model in order to make predictions now for biopsies. Which one is the growth rate of the proliferation rate, I'm sorry, for these uh, different types of cancer? In blue, maybe it's not possible to see, but this in blue is uh, represent the cancer, the normal uh, the cells for a patient, patient. We has been evaluated in addition with this, using this type of modeling, genome scale metabolic reconstruction. Which one is the activity for every one of these cancers, for instance, pentosphosphate? We can observe that if we compare these cancers, most of them seem to have a similar activity in a metabolic sense. However, this type of cancer, as you can see, has a lower activity over this pentosphosphate pathway. This is interest, interesting only to characterize the properties of cancer in the metabolic sense uh, for patients. Another thing, another project that we have working on is this one, that we would like to make um, a in silico tumor. It means using the current uh, technology in computation, CUDA, for instance, the parallel programming, we would like to, to be able to simulate the metabolic pathways for many of cells, which every one of these cells ca has the capacity to reproduce and eventually is growing a cancer in 3D. Uh, at the same time, uh, in parallel with the computational analysis, we have experimental validations and experimental measurement with this cancer cell line, MCF7, which is growing in, um, in a 3D way, in such a way that it's possible to observe how the cancer the tumor is growing on. Let me show you this, this plot. Um, this is a curve that represents uh, uh, the, the diameter diameter distribution for every one of the, of the tumors, and this is the time. According to the time evolved, you can observe that, of course, the, the radio or the diameter is increasing. Every one of these times, we have select, selected uh, two times uh, with the purpose to identify which one are the metabolic changes between one specific time and the other one. Specifically, we have been interested in seven days and uh, 70 days. Um, this was important because there is evidence, as, as we, we obtain here, that when the tumor is very, uh, the diameter is very close, most of the cells inside the tumor are proliferating. However, if the diameter increase, there is certain time over the time, over the time that uh, an inner, um, inner cells entry in a quiescent state. It means the cancer cell stop to growth. Meanwhile, the others are growing. So there is a metabolic change. We use RNA-6 in order to analyze which one are the pathways that are changing over these, uh, these two times. And as a result, we conclude this following, following um, that according to the growth, the spheroid of MSC F7 is growing. There is the presence of two, two types of, uh, of cells, cells of cancers, of breast cancer, that are in two different physiological states. One of them are proliferating, and the second one are in quiescent state. That's not growing. Um, analyzing the data, we conclude that there is a metabolic dependence between the proliferative cells and the quiescent cells. Essentially, the hypothesis that we are playing with and we are suggesting is that the plurif plurifer plurif uh, proliferative cells consume glucose, introduce the glucose through glycolysis, activate the TCA cycle, and they produce lactate. lactate. Part of the lactate is going on to the external condition, to the environmental. Another part of the lactate is used for the quiescent cells in order to make the metabolism inside the cell. This quiescent is not growing. However, they need an ADPH to make a front and to make face of the, of the oxidative stress condition that is inside in inner regions of the tumor. This is the conclusion that we have been obtained. Essentially, according to the cells are growing, and in cells inside the, the, the tumor is capable to, to sense, essentially, the concentration of oxygen in the local environmental, the oxidative stress, and the energetic condition inside the cell. Once uh, these uh, genes are turned on, 
they induce the activity of OXO, and FOXO is capable to induce the quiescent, stel, uh, quiescent um, state and activate the gluconeogenesis. Instead to use the glycolytic pathways, the uh, um, quiescent cells is using a gluconeogenesis pathway, which is completely different in terms of metabolic sense. So let me, let me conclude here. We are working, of course, uh, as, you, as you see, in, um, in metabolism. We are extremely interested to apply in personalized medicine. It's not an easy issue, given the conditions and the complexity that the body has, uh, has, uh, has inherent, no? inherent to this one. But um, that's our final objective, using metabolism. We hope that in the future, this will be very central uh, to contribute for the medical uh, um, uh, activities to suggest like a new strategy to the same the best uh, procedure in treatment. Okay, thank you so much. We have time for a few questions. Osvaldo, uh, very interesting talk. Um, two comments. The first one, it's a story that it's very uh, unknown <laughs> about the HeLa cells. So when I was doing a postdoc in the US, there was this guy working with HeLa cell lines. And um, he was working on a, an apoptotic pathway. Long story short, there are two HeLa cell lines both of them are supposedly cancerigenous, but only one of them is truly cancerigenous. The other one is a, it's a regular cell that is induced to be oncogenic by the expression of an oncogene. The only way to distinguish between the two is because the original HeLa cells are from a black woman. And uh, yeah. this, um, this guy this. learned, uh, because he was working with caspase 12, uh, that, that their black, uh, black people do not express caspase 12 for some unknown reason, mm. but the white ones do. Um, so it will be interesting to know which HeLa cells you're working with, yeah, if yeah, it's yeah. really tumorogenic or is a cell that was induced to be an oncogenic uh, cell line. Yeah, it's a good point, yeah. Yeah, so th that's one observation. The other one is... Um, about this issue with the um, change in metabolism, this year Nature published a very interesting paper that uh, I discussed with some of the colleagues in the institute, among other ones, uh, Dr. Marieta Tuena, that she's been working with metabolism for many years. And the paper reports that it's possible in an anaerobic conditions similar to the ones that you have in in vitro when you cultivate cells human cells mm. to reproduce the complete tca without enzymes mm. all you need is a particular um, um what is the name of this um, compound that works as the catalyzer um i will send you the paper but okay perfect uh, I, I'm quite interested to know if what you are seeing is a consequence of an activation of the non-enzymatic uh, production of the TCA metabolites uh, mm -hmm. that rather than being a, 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 the consequence of gene regulation. Yeah. Yeah, please send me that's, that yeah. paper. Sounds very interesting. Octavio, thank you for your talk. What, what's the, in your model, is there an objective function for the quiescent cells? Yes. And, and what is that? What is it? I'm well, curious about we it. We have been working with two objective functions. This objective function is, is, the, is the main guide in order to, to identify the pathways for this, uh, for this network. So we have been working essentially with uh, metabolites that we know that should be required for, for, um, for growing, no? for proliferation, and ATPH, ATP. In addition, 
now we have uh, exploring one method. That the idea is is to try to to move uh, to try to give the the drone uh, uh, another try another direction, because the objective function sometimes is difficult to define it. For E. coli, the objective function is perfectly well measured. However, for human cells, is is completely um, unknown. Yeah, and even know? harder for non-proliferating cells, yeah, where yeah. biomass is less important, yeah. I guess. However, we have been working, trying to, with uh, using this information, define an objective function in, on, this, uh, on this base. However, we have another method that we are proving. It's essentially to select the metabolome data. From the metabolome data, it's possible to identify which one are the metabolites that should be increased or decreased between one physiological condition. So we are proving another techniques. Uh, instead to define the, in a very precise way the function, using this metabolome data that came from experimental data. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was just wondering how you arrived from your metabolome data to the flux distribution. Like, because you only measure the concentrations of the metabolites. Yeah, and yeah. The, so yeah, the central, in the method, the central hypothesis is assumed that all the metabolic reactions follow low mass action. Okay. That is the central uh, objective. In fact, we can extend to, 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 to assume generalized low mass action, which is more, uh, uh, este, uh, the scope is higher, no? But this is the central hypothesis that we are assuming here. Okay. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, the results you obtain when you have a culture of cell, a cell culture, and because there you have a medium and things outside that which can affect the response of the cells uh, in different conditions, and so you can have a metabolic, a metabolome, a different metabolome depending on how you grow the cells. Is that right? Yeah. So do you do you have results on the full tissue that can be compared with those of the tissue culture, so that you can say what happens in each in each case? Yes, we have metabolome for the culture. For the case of the rat, we have uh, from the tissue, the health tissue, and the, mm -hmm. the, the, the tissue with, uh, with cancer. We have this, this information in such a way that we can say which one are the metabolites, which are intra, intracellular. That's important. Mm -hmm. It's not the exo, exo, exo metabolite, or I don't know how to say it. No, it's not the metabolites outside, it's inside the cells. That's just, uh, one condition. Okay, thank you. Do you consider compartments in your models? In this model, no. No, but it's possible. It's possible. Well, um, if you ask me if this uh, will change too much the, the, the phenotype behavior or the results that we have, I expect that not. But I prove, of course. Only we need to include a more transporter, no? This is very important things. When you make a metabolic reconstruction, as much as possible, you should have information about the new reaction that you include, no? In order to ensure that the new reactions will not decrease the quality of the reconstruction. Every one of the reactions should be verified or should uh, have uh, evidence in a bioinformatic sense or experimental sense that you have these components in the reaction. So if you have impor information about the transport mechanism in a biological sense, you can include it. But here, mm, we don't have it. Thank you. Last question. Um, I hope it's a quick one. Uh, so have you checked how many of these increases in some enzymatic functions can be explained by genomic rearrangements, especially in the cancer cell line, they have been super characterized. We know exactly what has been rearranged, which chromosome has been extended. So have you looked back into explaining why this increase? It, did something change? You have now three, type, uh, three times the same enzyme gene, or is it relation? Because you could actually explain it for something. No, not yet, but this is a good uh, point to try to go in the genome information, you mean, no? Yeah. We have been working with microarray data, trying to, to link this genome information, the metabolism, with microarray data and try to, to go back, no? And see what happened in lower layers. Okay. Thank you.